traveling and beyond. I'm Helen, I'm going to be the moderator, but most of the discussion is going to be by the folks. So I'm going to turn it over to them. We're going to do an introduction and um, a little bit of story. Uh, I'm Ryan, I do Toku Magazine based out of Canada. Uh, I grew up most of the time on the East Coast, I'm now kind of in the central part. Um, I have spent time in Korea and Thailand, and I guess through the magazine I know a lot of people with writers and stuff who are all over the place. So international activism, at least for me, wasn't maybe necessarily like a direct going and talking in conferences and that sort of stuff. It was more just me living, say, in Korea and talking to people about it and being up front about the fact that I was vegan and having those discussions and meeting other people in the community who maybe were vegan or vegetarian and seeing what they were doing. Uh, as well, obviously, say with the magazine, like I try and get people writing from pretty much everywhere. Although a lot of people seem to think it's a Canadian based magazine, it's, it's digital and online, so it's kind of whoever can access the internet is all good. Um, so I have had a lot of people that write from, you know, different places and we do city and like country reviews to give people an idea of what veganism is there and um, I think as Terry talked about before in like the past panel, kind of just like an idea of how vegan or veganism is so prominent in other places and, you know, I think um, Sean, maybe that another panel, mentioned how he's gone into places where it's not even on the menu that it's vegan, but it just, just is vegan. Uh, so, I just, I think maybe I'm trying to get more, more awareness from people who say read the magazine about the fact that veganism isn't necessarily like a, a Western or North American thing, it's happening in a lot of other places, maybe it's got different names to it. Um, and I guess some of the things that I've seen talked about in other, other panels that have happened is this idea of um, kind of trying to go and learn what the people are doing there and maybe seeing how you can kind of fit into that and maybe amplify a bit versus the idea of international activism maybe some bigger groups have of, oh, these people over there are doing this terrible thing and we need to raise a lot of money and fight it and stop them from doing it because they're horrible and et cetera, et cetera. And obviously there's tons of issues with other forms of oppression involving that. Um, yeah, so I guess, you know, I try and avoid that through letting People tell me what they're doing, and I try and put that out there so I can learn about it. Hi, I'm Alicia Tell, and I'm living mostly in Brisbane in Australia. And um, I run a website called VivaLiving.net, and um, that's been going since about 2005. And it's pretty much now, almost 10 years later, now where I want it to be. So it has taken a while, and that's what I suggest for people with blogs like keep at it and build, build it and just. Go with, the, go with the stream to where it brings you. Um, it started to promote my recipe calendars I released and um, now it's like a multimedia hub. So there's forums, there's blogs, articles, interviews. Um, I've released ebooks and books, um, videos, we've got mentors, um, t-shirts, lots, lots of things. Um, we do an athlete interview series every week. Um, I've got a question and answer video series on YouTube. And um, I focus mostly on the positive aspects of veganism and just promoting um, from a compassionate, sort of non judgmental way because I think that's the best way to promote anything. Um, I also run a website and a group, a not for profit environmental group called Green Earth Group in Brisbane. And um, we put on a couple of all vegan environmental festivals and um, we've got three to four thousand people at those. Um, and I do social media marketing as well. Um, with Green Earth Group, um, we organise a lot of smaller events now. So we do like potlucks, video screenings, outreach and leafleting, letter writing, um, portable workshops and social trail work, walks. So we have quite a lot of people involved with that. Um, also, um, I was going to be a rock star on stage. So mm -hmm. I have my leashontel.com website and there's a lot of writing and poetry and stuff on there. Um, I love travelling and so I, especially in winter, in back home, so it's winter back home, that's why I'm here, and, um, and the sun is out today, so all is good. And so I, I've been to America a few times and I'm also throughout Australia and I've just been to Southeast Asia for six months and I primarily went there just to try and chill out and um, 
work on some books and because the second week I was there I met the general manager of the Indonesian Vegetarian Society and they um, invited me to speak at all these conferences and so I went back and forth to Indonesia quite often and um, that was half of the time I was away to be honest. Um, but it was wonderful and I met some amazing people and I pretty much say yes to a lot of things and just see where the wind takes me when I travel. So, you know, I'm quite open to whatever I'm meant to do. And um, I learned a lot about um, veganism and um, how to relate or not to relate to people in a really good way, just from being away from being immersed in like the Australian or the American vegan and animal rights scenes. And um, I find that's probably my best sort of suggestion I can give to anyone, just try and have a break and go away for a while just so you can see things from an, an outsider's perspective rather than when you're like immersed in it and you think you know everything because as soon as you think you know everything is when you don't you know and um and yeah so there's a, a, a few different um groups that i've worked with when i was overseas and it's pretty much just meeting people getting to know people working with them doing talks with them when i met them in talks um a lot of people wanted to um know how to make things like baking i've never baked so much in my life and um cakes, you know, cheese, I have a, one of my um, YouTube videos on how to make um, vegan cheese with nutritional yeast and that was one of the most popular things that I did there as well. And um, just seeing, you know, it's not that easy to get nutritional yeast in Asia, for example, and to be saying to someone you need to buy this product to make something vegan when it's $12 and, you know, people make $2 a week for their whole family, um, that's, that's pretty ridiculous really. So it's really hard to sort of find those, those balances between educating people in a judgmental and non-threatening way and then trying to get them to see out, outside of the square of it as well. And um, you know, the, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of issues um, that I noticed, like you know, for example, Indonesia is a pr predominantly Muslim country and there's a lot of sacrifices that they do all the time that relate to animals. And um, then, you, then I was speaking at a lot of, say, Buddhist places or temples. And when you're in a Buddhist temple, you know, Muslim people would not come to that area. So you're completely shutting yourself off from the majority of the public by hopping in an area that other people aren't really um, welcome or feel accepted in. So there's lots, lots of different things that we can talk about, but um, that's, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. So look forward to your questions. Okay, and better, like a little bit more formal, so I'm going to show this presentation. It's a government presentation, so that's sort of how I And I'm also going to talk about an experience I had about a year ago where I decided to take a leave of absence from my very high pressure government job where I'm trying to solve job poverty um, <laughs> to go on the road and really talk about veganism and do vegan demos. Uh, in places I've never been before. So I took four and a half months off and I went to uh, India, Thailand, Bali, Australia, New Zealand, and Hawaii and did classes everywhere. In India, they had invited me to go and do 17 classes in six cities across the country in a month. And it was in crazy intense just talking about trying to find nutritional yeast and you land in another city in India and the next day you're going to make fermented cashew cheese. And you're like, I have no idea where to get nutritional yeast or how to say that any of the dialects that are local to here. Uh, but it was an amazing experience and I learned a ton along the way. Um, I've been vegan for 28 years, so for a very long time. Uh, but it gave me so much new perspective on the entire movement. So if you're thinking about doing some travel as an activist or as a vegan, um, I think you need to start doing some research about where you want to go and why. So one of the things that I thought about before I left was what's happening in different countries right now with or the cultural relationships to animals, religion, tradition, and also the legal issues. So in different countries that I was visiting, there are actually very different laws around activism. When I was in New Zealand, there's very specific laws around uh, activism and terrorism that are quite connected. You have to be really careful in terms of what you're going to participate in. Uh, place, other places like Switzerland is like at the forefront of what's happening in animal rights, so you might be able to be a part of a movement that's actually way more advanced than where you come from and learn a ton about the different uh, ways that they're addressing issues and, and being a part of that moving, moving forward and bringing it home with you. 
Um, when I was in India, one of the reasons that they had invited me to go was because it's a country that we think of typically as being very vegan friendly, vegetarian, so much of being vegetarian. But as they become, um, as they, that country becomes more uh, capitalist, more Western influenced, they are actually eating way, way more meat and a lot more dairy and a lot more processed food. And they've had uh, a twofold increase in their rates of diabetes, and they really wanted to have some talks about plant based nutrition and plant based food. Um, because it's been such a sudden shift. It was really interesting talking about the way that they think about food and nutrition in, in India versus here. So before you go, some of the things to really think about is your role. So are you going as a tourist? Are you going as a volunteer? Or are you going as an activist? And what does that mean in terms of who you want to connect with beforehand? Um, I was really planful. I'm that kind of girl. I like to make a plan. I like to <laughs> have a list. So I am. Um, so I did a ton of outreach beforehand around Facebook, Twitter, couch surfing, doing the research on Happy Cow to really understand who are the activist groups in different places, what campaigns are happening, what could I be a part of, um, what do I have to offer. So a lot, I, I traveled the entire time that I was away, staying with different activists and working with different activists in all those countries. So I didn't stay, I stayed on a lot of couches, I stayed in a lot of spare rooms, that kind of thing. But Everywhere that you went when you were actually connecting and working on a project together, learned, I learned so much more about what was happening there, so much more about that culture than I would have if I was staying in a hotel and you know, wandering around the city. So it was a really fantastic way to approach it. And you know, it's amazing now to have social media and ways to connect with people anywhere and ask those questions before you go. Um, sorry, I'm going to go back. So this is uh, in India at a tiny uh, city in the south of India when I first got there. And uh, it's a city that is a, it's a project in humanity. It's like that's an, it's an intentional community that's about how can people from all over the world live together well. And it's been going on for decades, since the 60s, of course. Um, <laughs> there's some fantastic people, and they grow their own spirulina. So it's a place where you can get that, which is fun. Um, and we were doing, it was the first veg kickstart in uh, India that was the same time I was there was the first campaign to PCRM. Do you guys know PCRM? So it's the first time, and it was really exciting. So I was able to sort of connect with the group there that was hosting a bunch of vegan demos, um, and we put on tons of classes and had a great time with these lovely ladies. One of them is from Canada, and two from the States, who were there as volunteers in India to talk about veganism and support the project. And they were there, each of them, for about four months. Um, it was really cool to, to connect with them. So I think the other thing to think about when you're traveling is the issues that are important to you and, and talk to the activists in the city to sort of discover what else is important at that moment in that place. So one of the things that I discovered in India was that the issues are so different than what I think about in Canada. In Canada, we're really worried about things like the seal hunt. We talk about that a lot. We talk about fur quite a bit because you know, it gets cold and that's still an issue in Canada. We also have a lot of things around zoos and aquariums, which is, you know, building another aquarium across the street from my house, I have to walk past it every day. Um, these are not the big issues in India, right? This is just not what they're talking about. And so when you think about how you want to participate with other activists, having uh, the ability to just sort of ask questions and talk about how you can get involved and what's happening there. So in India, one of the things that's really common is that there's cows everywhere, cows out on all the streets everywhere, and there's also garbage everywhere. And so one of the big projects that they have going on is actually working with vets and other people who are trained in the city to um, extract plastic from cow stomachs. And it's a huge, huge issue uh, because cows will eat anything as they're wandering around the city. And um, it's a constant, it's like a constant cycle as well, which is, that's never been a thing on my radar in Toronto. I've never been worried about the cows eating plastic in Toronto. So, um, but it's interesting what you discover and what you think about. The other thing that's really common in India is a big issue. I actually met with a, a number of activists one night uh, in Mumbai, and they were all talking about what they were doing about stray dogs in their city. Um, again, this is, I mean, we have feral cats in Toronto, but I've never seen everyone around a room talking about what they do on their street, what they do in their neighbor's yard, because it's such a prolific issue. So it's really interesting to sort of see what are the in different areas and to learn about a totally different issue than you ever would have thought of um, when you're sitting in your own backyard. So as I said, um, ask about how you can help. So when you're in different places, some organizations you know they need money, some need supplies that you can bring with you depending on where you come from and what you might be able to offer. 
Um, this is taken from Elephant Nature Park, where I stayed in Thailand, which is owned by a vegan couple, which I know some other people here who didn't know as well, which is fantastic. Um, at Elephant Nature Park, they certainly do need things like funding and supplies. They treat a lot of elephants there, which they have vets that come from all over the world and volunteer their time. But what they wanted me to do was to empty that truck. So I did that a few times a day. And I scooped a whole lot of elephant poo. And I, you know, you do whatever you have to offer. So, you know, you teach classes if that's what you're good at. Um, it, it's really exciting sometimes to be the person who comes from abroad that brings a different perspective and can talk about something and they can bring a group together to hear you speak, which they may not be able to bring together for someone who's from their city. So in India, especially, I, I'm a certified raw chef, and so raw is like a totally new thing. Like they have never made smoothies in their lives. It's like, this is so awesome, I can show you this smoothie in two seconds. So that was something really different for them, and so that they can gather a crowd around smoothies in a way that in Toronto they'd be like, really, like, yeah, you push a button, like, it's, it's cool. So you really need to think about what you have to offer to different communities too, and, and ask them, don't assume, but ask how you can help. So this is one of the things I did uh, in Thailand. And I, again, I think one of the things about traveling you talked about as well is meeting those like-minded people around the way. So having an opportunity to understand what activists, or hear the stories of other activists, hear what they've been a part of, is incredibly inspiring. And if you've been a part of this movement for a long time, sometimes it's that change in perspective that re-inspires you and gets you reinvested in the importance of your work. And you really do get to see what's happening and feel like you're a part of a growing movement in a community. Um, I met some amazing people who were not at all vegan, but were a part of, this is at Elephant Nature Park too, that were volunteering their time, and it really was changing their entire mindset, their entire perspective on the world, and to experience that is so incredible. Especially if you kind of live in your vegan bubble all the time, and you're talking to your vegan friends about nutritional yeast and nutrition, whatever. You forget that for some people to think for the first time about this experience, how incredibly powerful it is, and it reminds you of what your role can be like in that process. Um, one of the things that happened at Elephant Nature Park is they really do talk about um, what the exploitation of elephants in Thailand. And for so many people that were there, they just thought this was another elephant sanctuary. And there's a lot of elephant sanctuaries in Thailand. Um, but this is the only one where we don't buy the elephants. And I think for a lot of people, they thought they were going there to buy the elephants. And when they start to hear the stories, they start to ask questions about a whole lot of other industries that are similar, where you, you kind of take it at face value, and you don't start to ask the question, it's like, why is this elephant so docile and lets me climb on its back? What is that, what is that process, right? Um, and it, it's a really magical thing to be able to be a part of and watch. So again, around the world, depending on what you're looking for and the kind of experience, um, you can also find vegan communities, intentional communities of vegans living together, who have an entire different perspective. So this is in India, this is called Sadhana Forest. And they are um, an intentional community that will always make a bed for anyone. If you show up, they will build you a bed. Any day, they will feed you. And they feel, feed the entire community every Friday night. And people come in, the locals come in, and they feed them all a vegan feast. And they show a film on activism of some kind. It's really cool. Um, and there's people who, who live there from all over the world that stay a day, and some that stay for months. And they're part of projects and activism. It's just something really cool if that's your thing. I'm no longer sleeping outside with 60 other people and past it. But if that's your thing right now, awesome. Like totally, it's, a, it's an incredible place to be. I know Costa Rica, I was just in Costa Rica as well, and it's another place where there's tons of intentional communities that are doing really interesting co work. If that's something that's interesting to you and inspiring, it's a great thing to get involved in and get sort of re inspired again. One of the other things that um, I would suggest if you're thinking about that, is to look at volunteering in sanctuaries. So even if you're traveling for lots of other reasons, and there's a sanctuary near where you're gonna be, um, seeing if you can take some time to volunteer at the sanctuary and hear about what's happening and learn about the animals. Um, this is, uh, man up there is another vegan from uh, Canada that I met while I was at Elephant Nature Park. I was like, awesome. And this is the elephant walking over to say hello. Um, one of the things that was the most inspiring thing about that trip is if I ever wanted to interact with an elephant in Toronto, I would have to go to a zoo. It's the only way that I would have that experience. So actually traveling to a place where these animals are living naturally 
It's the only place, this place and other sanctuaries, I assume, in Thailand, is the only place where you can see elephants living as families. Because everywhere else they're owned by a family, so one individual elephant, so actually to see them interact was so powerful for me. Um, to see elephants. elephants playing together um, as a family you, you can you know just watch the babies and them all rubbing up against each other pushing their brother and go on and he's like pushing his sister down into the water i was like this is awesome <laughs> it's so incredible and i think you know there's sometimes where you kind of lose that connection to the work that you're doing and an experience like this reminds you of how important it is that we stay present um, for the animals and start to really think about the impact of what we do and what we say. So with that in mind, I don't know why it doesn't like it anymore. Haha. <laughs> Research attraction. So this is on exactly the same point, is that when you're traveling, so we talked about sanctuaries, and not every sanctuary is created equal. You really do need to do your research and pay attention to um, what other people have said about it, who's running it, all that stuff, and the same with attraction. So there are some incredible places that you can go and learn about animals, and there's some incredibly exploited places around the world. So really paying attention to that when you, before you go. And I think the best thing to do is to talk to local activists and local vegan groups, because they have a really good sense of what's happening in their own area. Um, so this is again uh, in Thailand. And some of these, photos, these last few photos are from a, friend, a very good friend of mine, Joe and MacArthur. Anybody know Joe and MacArthur? Yeah. From We Animals, who's incredible. I'm going to leave her stuff at the end just so you can connect with her. She's a photographer who travels around the world job connecting activist work and telling the stories of animals uh, in, you know, has anyone heard or seen the film Ghost in Our Machine? Yeah. So Joanne is the one who's sort of featured in that film, um, and this, this is some of her work as well from her travels. So this is taken at one of the Thai temples, where you will see if you go to Thailand, they advertise the temples all over to go and visit with tigers. Um, the reality is that the tigers are very heavily drugged. Um, so you see all the people posing on the tigers and lying on the tigers and all that stuff, and it's something that's, you know, it's at a temple. People talk about it's at a temple, the tigers are so relaxed. Yeah. So just thinking through that and understanding the issues and really what is behind it is that we as tourists are often asking for this kind of thing, right? This is what we want to see when we go to Thailand. That's why it exists. It's not just they came up with this concept. People are asking to have this kind of interactions, and so we have to be then conscious about what we ask for when we travel and what we support. It makes a big difference in places that are um, responding to tourism demand. So the other thing I just wanted to mention was about culture. So this is an example of sort of bullfighting, and I think a lot of people when they travel uh, make, make make choices about where they go uh, based on some cultural issues. And I would say that I tend not to sort of boycott a country based on cultural issues. I really feel like often you can learn a ton about perspective, about what's happening in that culture, what is the relationship with the animals that's happening. Um, I think you can learn a ton if you want to, if you really care about that issue and it bothers you that it's happening, I think it gives you a great opportunity to be a part of the activism that's happening in that place and connect with the other vegans in that community and learn how you can have an impact rather than just sort of stepping away from the issue and pretending that that is how to make a difference. So the other thing just to mention is from home, there's still lots and lots of things you can do if you're not able to jump on um, the, the amazing thing that's happening today is like the internet has connected us with vegans all over the world and there are those communities, social networks, organizations, campaigns, and initiatives that you can support from the comfort of your couch, right? Like you don't have to go anywhere to say that I, you know, I want to support what's happening in Thailand because that's something I'm really connected to. Um, Nicole and I uh, created an ebook last year that was all to service because that's what we're into. And we made sure that a third of the proceeds went to Healthy Nature Park to be the heart. Like that was something for us. If we're gonna do something and sell it, it needs to be connected to the reason that we're doing that, which really is connected to the activism that we do. Um, so I think it's some, also to keep in mind though, when you're thinking about this kind of work, try to find ways to expand um, who you communicate it to beyond your normal vegan crowd. Right? Like it's typical that we know who we can talk to and who can share the information, but try to find other ways to connect people with what's happening in campaigns around the world. Because you might know somebody who's really interested in Costa Rica, thinks it's a beautiful country, and loves what they're doing in terms of ecotourism. So if you know about an amazing sanctuary in Costa Rica, find a way to make that connection and say, you know what, you love that country, there's some beautiful ways that you can do this. Or I heard about this great campaign that's happening in Costa Rica, and I know you love to travel there, and this might be something you're in, just 
So we try to find ways to sort of talk about this stuff um, and get more people involved. And then my last thought is just the stuff on the animals, um, because she does such incredible photos. Um, there's just the, the mandate there at the beginning, but she also has a book campaign where she's publishing all of the books, uh, all of her photographs from animals around the world that I would strongly, I already bought five copies, so I would encourage you all you know, to do it too, um, and just learn more about her work too. Ghost in the Machine, in our machine, is an incredibly powerful film. That's that. Thanks, guys. So now we're going to open up to questions, and I think this room is pretty good at so I don't know if I need to go around with the microphone. Um, but because I'm up here, I'm going to ask the first question. Um, so even if we aren't actively activists or traveling, we're just traveling for fun, we are sort of ambassadors of the vegan movement. How do you recommend conducting yourselves when you have any tips or tricks on being a vegan one? I mean, eventually we have to eat and that's going to come up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess at least I spent like six months in Korea, and I think in the beginning I was pretty much hanging out in my apartment the whole time. Uh, not necessarily the best way to sort of be an ambassador for veganism. Um, I didn't really learn the language either, which probably didn't help. I did, really, I just ended up connecting with other people that were vegan or vegetarian there, and I just kind of hoped that they would adopt me and I hung out under their wing. Because, I mean, especially if you're going to places where there are people that would normally travel, like say Thailand is you know, an incredibly easy place. You either look for the people that look like they don't belong there, or because of, say, like the religious culture and stuff, it's, the veganism thing isn't necessarily a difficult part of Thailand. Like, you just identify as either like a strict Buddhist and then like, go, oh, okay, I get that. Um, I mean, obviously, in other countries, it's a little more difficult. Like, other parts of Asia are definitely have that sort of like Asian veg vegetarian concept, which is more you like fish and everything, you're totally okay. And trying to get that across, I'm pretty sure I failed several times, and I probably ate some questionable like bibimbap or kimchi or something, but I kind of like let myself go with that, and just as long as I had the discussion and people sort of would start thinking about it, I was like, okay, that's cool. And I mean, obviously, I mean, part of it was my own ignorance with not learning the language, because apparently Korean's pretty easy. I just didn't learn it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, so just talking to people there, like I did connect with Koreans who were vegetarian and vegan, and actually, I think at least one or two of them transitioned to veganism based on, like, not necessarily just my influence, but just other people that they've been hanging out with. That, again, I guess earlier today was touched on, like, oh, you're one of the cool vegans. So it was, it was okay, you weren't like the really strict militant one. And so they were like, okay, cool, well maybe I should give this thought because you're a super friendly guy and, you know, maybe I could do that even just if I give up meat. And that, so. um, I definitely think what Ryan said about learning the language is really important or just, some, just something even thinking, please, you know, it really, it really helps. And um, just know the customs and like, for example, in Asia, if you're staying with a family, you need to, what they give you, like it's, it's really rude if you don't eat what they give you, and um, so due to that, I, I can go to some like out of the way um, places that I knew I would have to eat in the village, and I knew they weren't vegan friendly, um, and also because I, I don't um, drink, um, that they would encourage you to drink alcohol or, or something as well. So I didn't go to those sort of places, but it's definitely what you're saying before with. Um, do your, do, your, do your research and find out, you know, the things that you need to learn. I, I stayed at a lot of budget accommodation and I um, just booked that all online and then I would base where I stayed on, on Happy Cow or whatever, so whatever was the closest place I could eat that I could walk to. Mm -hmm. So, and then I would just go there and just walk around and, you know, people in Asia, I'll, I'll share a story, I came, I came to LAX airport a couple of weeks ago and got out and I, I couldn't get the SIM card I wanted. And I just asked someone if I could borrow their phone. And I asked three people and no one would let me borrow their phone. This is bad America. <laughs> and in Asia, someone would give me their phone. Like, it, and it's, you know, even in Australia, you could borrow someone's phone, it's not a problem. And everyone's got an iPhone in Asia. You know, don't, don't think we're all, you know, on top of, on top of them with all sort of stuff and I, I just thought it was such a contrast and I was in quite a bit of shock and I'm yeah. left me worrying about that phone and 
that they just do such beautiful things to you, for you and will just give everything. Like we said before, they make like nothing in comparison to what we make and they're just so happy and so welcoming and just would give you the show of their back type thing and you know you can learn so much from that. I would say I'm I'm really I'm really excited about food. Like I really love food. And so generally um, when I'm traveling I'm also I love to be like, okay, let's have a challenge. Let's go discover something awesome that's vegan and we'll find something and get people sort of excited about the process too. And uh, people are generally really like I remember there was a restaurant that I tried this one time, and I'm pretty sure there was something vegan. Like, they want to show you something in their town, too, so it's kind of fun to get them involved in that. I'm also the person who, before I land somewhere, I'm like, where's the closest farmer's market? When does it happen? I'm going to be there. Because I, like, I, I, part of, like, traveling is I get to see tropical fruits that I've never tried at home. There's food, vegetables I've never seen. That's part of the fun for me. So um, I really like to sort of not go for what is all the process stuff, but what grows here that I can discover while I'm here, what kind of ingredients can I try. Um, and I think people find that really exciting too. So it's not just about my veganism, it's like I'm so excited about what you have to offer in this country. Tell me about this, how do we use, this is a, I've never seen a gourd that's this height of me. What, what do I do with that thing? Um, so I went to a lot of farmers markets in every country that I visited. and. I've learned so much just talking to people about the produce that grows there. And um, I want to talk to you about it. Absolutely. So it was never just about like what I don't eat, it's like what I do eat and, and how exciting it is to discover those things. And so I think um, with, I know a lot of foods like say tofu and tempeh, I've spent a lot of time in Indonesia, mm -hmm. also Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, and um, Indonesia um, created, you know, tempeh and Nothing compares to like freshly made tempeh that's wrapped up in um, coconut leaves and um, um, banana leaves, sorry, and um, and with this thing called sambal, which is like a chili sauce made from all these different herbs and tomatoes and that. And yeah, it's pretty hard to come home or to go to some a Western country now and just thinking about all the yeah. great food you can get overseas. <laughs> I think the other thing is, is it also kind of depends on how long you have in the country. Like if, you know, obviously if you're there for say a week and you're kind of jumping around, there are like sort of the quick connections that you can make. But if you're there for actually like a few months or something, I mean, because one of the things that I connected with was uh, there was a guy who was, I think he was American, and he'd been in, um, in the city in Korea that I was in for four or five years, to the point where like he was teaching English at a university level. Job. He totally loved the place and he could speak the language really well. But he started doing um, environmental movie nights. So basically, he just hosted a documentary and people would come. And he actually put in the effort to do Korean subtitles as well. So, like, basically, the majority of the people within the city, when they heard about it, they could come. And the thing is, like, a lot of. <laughs> yeah, this. This is the best talk happening right now. Yeah. It's not that exciting out of the way. Um, so yeah, I mean, like, there's... Because the thing is, I mean, on top of that, I, I mean, obviously, depending on where you go, there's the fact that they want to learn from you, too. So as long as you're not, like, take, as long as it's kind of this whole, like, hey, let's share, talking about things and everything. And I mean, these movie nights, like, they were really popular. Like, some of the things that I've done in Canada never went over nearly as well. And I was amazed by it. He'd been doing it for, I think it might have been like a year or two. So I mean, obviously there was a bit of a foundation. But effectively, it was just people would come and they'd watch a movie that was environmental. It could be about anything. Like I hosted a couple. I did the, the Coca Cola case, which I recommend. Uh, and uh, something with the Nancy River, which was also a beautiful shot in Canadian. Which I actually, both of them were Canadian. I totally didn't mean to do that part, but it just happened. Um, but then afterwards, there would be like a vegetarian meal and he would actually arrange with one of the restaurants in the area and because he had such a following he could say to the restaurant listen i know you know maybe you don't necessarily do these things as a vegetarian or a vegan thing but i can pretty much guarantee you 30 or 40 people are going to be here tonight and if you can just take out say the fish sauce or a couple other things boom you've got 30 or 40 people eating at your place that maybe they'll come back and so effectively he was you know creating this little community within place that the movie would happen, but then he was also exposing vegetarianism or veganism to the restaurants in the area that would see that there's actually like maybe a little bit of probability right. that maybe, you know, we would have thought about it before, but because he was approaching them with that fact, 
they were actually looking to it. So, you know, because he had that ground there, he actually was able to sort of spread it a little bit more. And people were pretty open to it, and actually looked really well. On that note, one of the things that I did in terms of reaching out to people wasn't just to activist groups. I actually wrote to a ton of hotels um, and did a lot of workshops in hotels where they had guests coming from all over. And they really need exciting things for their hotel guests to go to. And so knowing who their clientele, depending on the hotel, what kind of things I would talk about or teach, really was a great question. And often they'll let you stay for a couple of nights for free if you do a little demo for them, uh, which was a great opportunity in places like Bali, where there's like tons of retreat centers and stuff where people are really interested in health and well-being. It's a great place to be able to do that kind of, that kind of work, too. And Bali's amazing with like, there's quite a western sort of yeah. scene there as well. And, um, um, I hate the term tourist, I, um, I, I prefer traveller, because um, I like to immerse myself in the, the world there. And, like, I, I would just walk down the street and talk to whoever and get to know people and um, you, know, you can you know, experience a lot more that way. I say with families and homes yeah. and stuff like that as well, which is the way they do it. And, um, but on, on that note as well, we have, um, a, lot of, a lot of the places you can go to eat are Western owned. Um, and it's, it's better to find out the ones that are locally owned um, and that are run by locals so that there's money going back to them instead of some Western person you know, um, giving a lot of money to have other people run it for them. Yeah, uh, so we've got about seven minutes. Um, so, Dan. Um, in China, there's a, a euphemism. The word vegetarian actually uh, means weak. And uh, mm -hmm. it's like built into the language almost. I was wondering, those of you who have traveled in East Asia or the lived in those parts of the world, when you come up against someone who culturally is convinced that you can't live without meat, you know, do you how do you approach those conversations? Uh, you know, when they're to them, it's almost a joke the way you, that you live. You know, you can say, "Well, I'm here, I'm fine," and you know, and try and talk yourself as evidence. But, have you had those experiences and how do you deal with them? Um, I, I think with me, I, I spoke to a lot of locals, so they see a lot of Westerners as what they're trying to attain to be. Um, so I didn't really get, get that as much, to be honest. Um, it was just, I, I think it's just leading by example, showing people how easy it is, and combining like, the white vegan or vegan activism talk with um, a demo after. So people could see, oh yeah, I was what she's saying. Especially that like, the Buddhist people who don't understand the dairy and the big sort of issues and explaining those things. Um, I think um, issues I had more so were in relation to their family. So like, oh, you need to I live with my family and they, they won't do it, they won't allow me to do it. And it. I think it's just educating people to feel comfortable within themselves to, to do it. I think uh, for me, I guess, I, I definitely came across it, um, even, like, I worked in an office in Korea, and, you know, I was the one weird one with, the, whatever, who wasn't, say, going out to the restaurants during lunch, or, say, um, a big part of the culture is definitely, like, the drinking thing, I wasn't really drinking thing either, so, I, I guess I was kind of lucky, because I think there were past foreigners that have worked there before, so some of my supervisors would have been kind of understood if I wasn't going to drink and eat meat during lunch, or go out after. Um, I also got lucky with the fact that in Seoul there was actually a Korean woman who did like vegan bacon and she sold it online. Like you could just basically order it and it would be delivered through the Korean publisher within like a day or two. And so I actually got a couple people in the office involved who ordered like big boxes of just these baked foods like, you know, banana bread and carrot cake and da da da. And so, I mean, through kind of the example of a lot of people, I kind of just glued them with food. Like, you know, they come by and be like, oh, what are you eating? And I'd be like, oh, it's a couple cookies. And they're like, here, have one. And then some of the Koreans were actually super impressed with it. I mean, they'd still be like, oh, but it's strange that you don't eat meat, and, you know, whatever. And I mean, it's very, like, it's very much in the Korean culture for sure. Um, and I think part of it is maybe the Western influence, and it's all like a slight, like, a financial sort of thing. Because, you know, if you can afford meat, then obviously you're going to eat it, why wouldn't you? Uh, but I guess I also kind of grew up in Eastern Canada, so I'm kind of used to feeling like I was sort of out of the loop. If you grow up in Newfoundland and you don't eat fish and you don't drink, you kind of you're, you're weird. So I don't, I didn't, I didn't find it a lot more worse. I just, I was like, okay, you know, that's that's the way it is. So 
you know, but yeah, I think it's helped. <laughs> You guys talked about not being able to find nutritional yeast. What about using, you talked a little bit about local food, but yeah. did you like learn the food that was local to the area and then veganizing it or anything like that? It, um, for India in particular, I did a ton of work back and forth with them about what, uh, what was going to be available in different places. Because India is a huge country as well, right? and things that are available in the south are not going to be available in the north. And I was mostly working um, in the south with different chefs at their restaurants and then in different hotels. So, and there's also, you know, the day before your demo, the 16 pounds of zucchini, the office is going to be there. Because in India, you think 50 people are coming and 300 people come to your demo um, the next morning. So it was, a, it was like a constant game. Um, but I really did want to try to find stuff that was not, that was going to be accessible. So partly when I did those menus too, I looked for things that I could use in multiple different ways in that menu. So if I was like, we're going to find some cashews, So I'm going to try and look, show different ways to use that ingredient um, and mix it up with local stuff. So I learn how to make this bottle or that's everywhere and what can I do with that and what does it taste like when we use it in ways that I would use for and pomace and similar. So I did do some research just because it was going to be so fast in each city. Um, and some other places like Thailand, there was so much that I was calling to Toronto that I could use uh, for recipes that were more comfortable for me. Um, so it really depended on where it was going to be. Was I going to be in the middle of nowhere? Or was it going to be somewhere where there was like a restaurant shop that had really easy access to ingredients? But I think it's more fun to learn about what's happening in that country too. Yeah, sometimes I had um, an organic uh, like health food store that pretty much lots of the things I did. So it gave me, they were able to put a lot of things in. So what I did was just explain to people. Groups and 
um, if everyone's interested. Um, there's a place um, an island called Java in Indonesia, and they have a place called Yogyakarta, uh, which is like a college type town. And they have a and people call it Jogja for short, and there's a place called Animal Friends Jogja, and they rescue a lot of cats and dogs, re them, and they also do a lot of um, dolphin stuff and um, dog fighting, and they do a lot of activism as well. Um, there's also a run in Jakarta called Jan, J A A N, Jakarta Animal Action Network, and the center. And in Bali itself, there's like Bawa and Rila Kitty that look after dogs and cats. So there's a lot of um, places that you can get involved with. And if you go to some of their events or just donate or just even drop into the 